so much. What a joy to be with you. It is always a joy to look forward to coming over here. And uh, I was sitting there reflecting. It's been 15 and a half years since I've been in this assignment. And when uh, this assembly comes, there'll be a new person stepping in to take this place. And I was thinking back, 16 years, the transitions that have taken place on the district, the transitions that have taken place in this local congregation, working with the church board here and to work with your pastors as they've been here. It has been a true joy to watch God do a work that only He can do. I've often said it's good that we do not know the impact we make. Otherwise, human nature would want to take credit for it. It's all to God's glory. It's not for any of us. None of us. God chooses to work through people. He doesn't have to. But He chooses to work through people who are willing to submit to His Lordship. And when we see trans, uh, transformed lives, and we see marriages saved, and we see babies growing up, and we see marriages in Christian homes, it's to God's glory. Amen. And we trust Him to continue working in us, and then through us, Amen. to accomplish what He wants us to do. So I want to say thank you to the congregation. There are very few of you that are here when the Pastor Gardner came in 1964. Others of you have been touched by his life over those 37 years. And then the transitions that this church has gone through that brings Brother Don to us. This is God's man for God's hour and God's place. He is God's And we are grateful to see him continue to develop. It really has been a joy to be somewhat of a mentor to the younger pastors as they come up. I remember when I started out, uh, I'm thinking, man, you know, these older people that have invested in me, my, my life is made up of older people investing in me. And it's been a rather interesting challenge for me to think, I'm now the old guy. <laughs> and I, people are looking to me to invest in them. Uh, it's an honor to be able to do that. But as I said, I don't feel as to anything I've done is to God be the glory, and we're grateful for that. So thank you, Don and Donna, for your ministry here. The people love you, and it's a joy to watch them develop in you. It's also a pleasant joy today to see Cliff and Nancy Schultz. They have history here in this church. And uh, they're, what I would call, veteran pastors, uh, retired uh, now for some about five years or so. And it was a pleasant surprise when I walked in to see him here today. So I thank the Lord for His ministry as we uh, carry on. We don't retire from ministry. We don't retire from a call. We will resign from an assignment. And uh, if I were to stay for uh, another year to 2016, uh, they would kick me out. <laughs> because our polity says you can't serve after so many years of age and I will have hit that age. And, and I have a human, selfish resistance about being kicked out of anywhere. So I'm leaving on my own, <laughs> under my own terms. But I do have peace from God in doing that. So we pray for the district. We don't know what the next leadership is going to look like. And so we simply ask for your prayers as we move through these next uh, seven or eight months as we go through district assembly. But what a joy it is to be a part of this congregation today. And speaking of joy, when we had that opening chorus, man, joy, 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 do you realize that you add or subtract from people's joy? You are a key player in someone else's joy. So I want to talk about that. There's a difference, as you've probably heard, between joy and happiness. Happiness is dependent upon external circumstances. It's a beautiful day for a barbecue. Boy, are we happy. <laughs> when the sun shines, we're happy. It looks like it's going to be a nice day. When the clouds come, well, there's a tendency to be a little bit sad or blue. We, we don't want, we can't be out today. Circumstances dictate happiness, but joy is independent from external circumstance. Wow. Joy is something that only God can give down on the inside that bubbles up 
in the midst of negative circumstances. One of Paul's most personal letters, the Apostle Paul's most personal letters, focuses on joy. It's the book of Philippians. And this letter to the Philippians was written when he was deep underground in a dungeon, chained to where he was. Guards all around him, 24-7, 365. He had no real freedom. And yet in the book of Philippians, he mentions joy and rejoice over 14 times in just that four-verse passage that he writes to us. That's why I say joy is independent from circumstances. So regardless of the circumstances in our lives, we can have joy in the midst of those circumstances. And the good news is that joy is never exhausted. There's always more joy that just keeps on coming. So that means as much as uh, joy as Paul had, there was more joy for him to have. Whatever our circumstances today, the author of joy, the author of peace is God. We don't Amen. generate that within ourselves. He gives that to us. Amen. Here's how Paul refers to this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. We'll be in this letter for our moments this morning, so I would encourage you to open your scripture to Philippians. It's uh, a joy book. <laughs> Here's how he says in Philippians 2.2, 2, writing to the church of Philippi, make my joy complete. Now, if any of you follow the old movies, you know, you'll remember Clint Eastwood, make my day. <laughs> Paul is saying, make my my joy complete. That means that there are things that the church at Philippi can do to add joy to Paul's life. There are things that you can do to add joy to your pastor's life. That you can do to add joy to your family life. That you can do to add joy to one another. That you can do to add joy to a total stranger. It amazes me in our world today and how population has increased here in Southern California and uh, how jammed our freeways have become. But it amazes me how little eye contact people want to make when you walk down the street. I deliberately try to make eye contact without hitting them in the face or anything and smile at them or nod at them. And invariably when I do that, they will generally respond back with a smile or with a nod. We can give joy to people by our behavior, and that's why I've entitled this message The Joy of Partnerships. The Joy of Partnering Together. How do we bring joy to one another? The outline is very simple today. I'm sure you've heard of it. So I'm preaching something that is common knowledge to all of us. Joy. J-O-Y. Jesus, others, you. When we keep that priority, then we begin to tap into the source of joy. So let's talk about J, Jesus. I want to give you another acrostic to help you remember what Jesus is to us in this whole joy issue. I'm using the word map, M-A-P, phonetically, Mary, Adam, Paul, <laughs> M-A-P. Jesus is, first of all, our model. He's the example. Here's how Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and following. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Whoa. What a high standard. And I echo that. Help us, Lord. But that's what he's saying. Jesus is our model. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. And then he defines what that looks like in his following statements. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, 
but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. This model that Jesus is to us. First of all, Jesus gave up his rights. A lot of our unrest in our society, in our culture, has to do with people demanding their rights. We have a right to this. A lot of family arguments between husbands and wives and between parents and children have to do with rights. You don't have a right to do that. Or I have a right to this. Jesus showed us in his attitude that he gave up his rights. His rights was to express his godness. He is a part of the triune Godhead. Amen. Scripture says he was there from the beginning of time and participated in the creation process. We are here because of Jesus Christ. Amen. He had some tremendous rights, but he chose to give them up. He did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. But he modeled another area for us. And that was he gave up his self-directed ambition. Ambition is God-given. We could never accomplish anything without ambition. There is a drive within mankind to accomplish as much as we can do. Make life as good as possible. Come up with the best inventions we can come up with to make life easier and, and, and happier. But it's self-directed ambition that Jesus is talking about here. Is it all about me? Or is it all about others? Or is it all about God? I'm sorry to say that some of the interesting discussions that I have gotten into over the last 15 and a half years with church boards have brought out the fact that a lot of the problems in the church is it's all about them. It's not about God. It's not about others. It's all about me. I want this kind of worship. We were looking for a pastor in one of our churches, and uh, I had a candidate there. He preached. I met with the board afterwards, and one lady said, I do not want him as my pastor. And I says, well, tell me why. Because he didn't wear a tie, and he didn't stand behind the pulpit. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, if I'm understanding you correctly then, you want a cultural pastor, not a biblical pastor. She said, what are you talking about? I don't understand. You know, what are we looking for? Are we wanting what God wants down deep inside or are we measuring things based on my comfort my desire, my ability to enjoy, doing it my way. Lord, what do you want for us? Jesus gave up his rights and he gave up his self-directed ambition. Scripture says he did what God told him to do. He said what God told him to do. He didn't even come expressing himself. He came as God's instrument. Amen. And that's exactly what we are if we are sold out to God. We are God's instrument. We are, if you please, Christ in the flesh to people. So Jesus is our model. But simply having a model doesn't guarantee that you'll look like that model. Why she said, Lord help us. <laughs> we recognize where we fall short of that model. Do you realize that all major religions in the world have almost the same identical moral codes? If you compare the moral ethics of Buddhism and of Hinduism and the various world religions all have the basic same moral code, however, none other than Christianity has the ability to live up to that moral code. We have Christ in us. The hope of glory. 
Scripture calls that a mystery. I'm not here to describe that mystery other than just to announce it. It's a mystery. I don't know how it is that God arranged for His Spirit to come into us, but His Spirit is the enabler so that Jesus, the A part of this Jesus thing, is He's the activator that helps us become more Christ-like as we go. Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That means that God is at work. Hallelujah. I would be a mess if God weren't at work in me. But it also means that God isn't going to stop working. I'm glad to hear that. How often do you feel like giving up on somebody when you've worked with them, you've worked with them, you've worked with them, and failure after failure, you just feel like it's no use, just give up on them. How many times have we failed God? And where would we be if He gave up on us? He says that He who began a good work in you will not make he will carry it on to completion. How long? Until the day of Christ Jesus. That means God isn't going to stop. That's a good praise report. I mean, that's, yeah, can I have a witness? That's a good amen. To God be the glory. So Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he says in chapter 2, verse 13, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. God has a plan. He has started to work in you. He says, I'm not going to stop working into you. I don't care how many times you fail, all the way up to the day of Christ Jesus. I'm just going to keep right on investing in you and working in you and trusting you to respond and this is exactly why in the last chapter, Paul, Paul says, mm -hmm. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. Christ can do all things through me he wants to do if I give him permission. <clears throat> if I give up my rights. If I give up my self-directed ambition. If I say, Father, your will be done, not mine. So Jesus is not only our model, He's also our activator when we allow Him to be Lord. But He's more. He's also, this is the P word in Matt, He is our provider. Again, notice how Paul puts it in Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. When you th read through that entire letter, you're going to discover that the context of that phrase is an economic context. He's talking about material needs. He's talking about how we get through life, Monday through Sunday, and do it again. God knows who you are, knows where you are, knows what your needs are. He's committed to you. And as you continue to submit to His Lordship, you can trust Him. David said it this way in Psalm 37, I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Wow. To go through life and to be able to look back, any of us that are up in years, can recognize God's hand at different points, even more importantly than at other points. God helped. God helped. God helped. God helped. That's why when we come to church, it's to God be the glory. Great things He has done. Nehemiah said it this way, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Sometimes we say, well, I have joy in the Lord. But what this verse is saying is not so much focusing on our joy in the Lord, but the Lord's joy in us. When I behave in a way that is pleasing to God, 
Heaven rejoices. God rejoices. God takes joy in us when we behave the way God wants us to behave. So we don't grieve. We recognize that God having joy in me gives me strength to go on. Gives me the ability, gives me the tenacity, gives me the willfulness to keep on doing what God wants me to do. So Jesus is our model. He's our activator and our provider. That's the J of joy, Jesus. Well, the O is others. That's really where our focus should be. Paul said in Philippians 2, 4, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now he said that because later on in verse 21 he said, for everyone looks out for his own strengths and interests, not just those of Christ. We are to be looking out after that which Christ cares about. That's why you have your various ministries that you do, and I praise God for those that you're doing. That's why I love every time I come to see the fruit of the Spirit that has been placed up here and is still up here. That's why I see this, worthy's the Lamb to do these kinds of things. And the ministries that have been announced and what you do is because your focus is not on yourself. It is on others. And so, Jesus, others, and now you. When you come down to you at that point, all you can do is just recognize, Lord, I'm just a servant. I'm just here to serve you. The very first sentence of Paul's letter to the Philippians, when he wrote this letter, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ. That's how he introduced himself to this church in that letter. We come as your servant. Oftentimes we see hierarchy of management from the bottom grassroots and then it seems like as it goes up further you have the CEO or the chief at the top. If leadership is really understood, it would be turned upside down. The CEO serves his team, who serves his team, who serves his team and goes up. We are all here to serve those outside of us. Do you realize that the church is the only organism in the world that was created for those who are not yet a part of it. Think about that. It's not about us. I mean, yes, you're important, but you are here for the sake of others. Yeah. And it's those outside that's our target group. Mm -hmm. Churches ought not to be in competition with one another. We don't want to compete with other churches. We want to compete with Satan and recognize as the unchurched that's our target group that we're trying to reach. We are here to serve others. And in doing that, we are partners in that process. Paul continued on in Philippians, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. We're in this together. Pastor, you don't stand alone. Associate pastors, you don't stand alone. Church, you don't stand alone. One of the strengths of denominational churches is that we're not out here by ourselves. I've talked with many of an independent pastor, an independent congregation, say we see the value. We've actually had congregations join us because they saw the value of having that kind of mutual strengthening of one another rather than feeling like they're doing it by themselves. We are in this together. And in that servant mindset, in that partnership mindset, then we are joy givers to one another. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. He says later on in Philippians 2.17, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you also should be glad and rejoice with me. We're just a joyful bunch. 
we just give joy to one another. Now, if you want to try that from a human standpoint, just think of laughter. I don't know if you've ever done this or not. I've done it. Have you ever been in a group to start laughing? <laughs> <laughs> They'll think you're nuts, or they'll start laughing with you. They might have no idea why you're doing it. Well, that's the secret of joy. When you give joy, it gives joy, and joy responds with us. But here's the last thing I want to share with you. It's tucked away in one verse in chapter 3. Rejoicing is a safeguard for us. Here's what it says. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Do we realize that when we stop giving joy, Satan has a foot in the door? We've, we've cracked it open just enough for him to create disillusionment, for him to focus our eyes on the wrong thing, for him to make us sad, but if we refuse to allow him to do that, whoa, we just slam the door in his face. I've got joy. And it becomes a safeguard when we rejoice together. Well, I want to use this triangle this way this time. The top point is J, standing for Jesus. Bottom left is Oh, others. The bottom right is the why, you. Do you realize that if others get closer to Jesus and you get closer to Jesus, you're all getting closer to each other? And that's the strength of rejoicing together as a safeguard. Joy in the Lord and sharing that joy we are partners, and we build safety for one another. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. I've got the love of Jesus, love of Jesus down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. Six more versions of the same one another and share that 